Good morning, everyone. Nice to see so many of you on the call this morning. It's just about 10.01, but we have a few more folks who are just jumping on. So we'll just wait another minute or two. Um, I know everyone's time is precious, so we'll get started in, in just a moment, but so great to see so many folks this morning. All right, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us as we kick off the Fund for Women and Children for 2022. It's so wonderful to see so many of you on the call this morning. Wish we were in person, but I know we all feel the same way, so <laughs> no need to, to reiterate the same. Um, I'm Elizabeth Rowley, the President and CEO of the Community Foundation of Orange and Sullivan, and of course, a proud member of the Rowley family and the Rowley Family Foundation, which is the... Um, really group and, and uh, you know, family behind the Fund for Women and Children. I'm joined here this morning with my family. I'll introduce them quickly and you'll hear from all of them in a moment. But of course, my stepmom, Mary Ann Murray, my father, Rich Rowley, and my sister, Lauren Rowley. So they're all here. Say hello, everyone. Good morning. Hello. Good morning. <laughs> nice to be here. So we're all in the conference room at the Community Foundation. We've got some cool technology going, so hopefully you can all uh, see us and hear us as, as we go through the presentation. But just a couple of other quick housekeeping notes. Um, we are recording this call this morning so that we can share it with folks who were not able to join us. So just uh, behave. a note about that. Yeah, behave yourselves. <laughs> Um, also, we do welcome you to uh, put questions or comments in the chat. Uh, we probably will answer um, and take some time to answer questions at the end of the call, but please feel free to jump in at any time if there's anything you'd like to say or ask while, while it's fresh in your mind. So I also wanted to just quickly um, thank and mention uh, my staff here at the Community Foundation. Um, we're joined by Nicole Feller-Lee, our Director of uh, development and Communications, uh, Megan Martini, our Communications and Administration Associates, and Lisa Mitchell, our Programs and Donor Services Coordinator, the newest member of the team here at the Foundation, who hopefully many of you will be meeting in the weeks and months ahead. Good morning. So just quickly, we wanted to um, share some remarks about the background of the Fund for Women and Children. For those of you who may um, be new to this initiative, um, and this, this effort that we uh, are putting forward today and, and sharing some news about. Um, but just some quick background, this fund was established in 2019 with an inaugural round of grants to 15 organizations in the three counties that were focused on Orange, Ulster, and Sullivan counties. Uh, those grants back in 2019 totaled $519,791. And really, this strategy was designed to be as efficient and effective as possible in targeting resources and solutions that are making a difference for women and children here in our communities. Now, these 15 inaugural grantees each offered a unique and impactful program structured, again, to empower women and their families here in our region. Now, while the majority of these programs were underway or even completed by the time the pandemic swept our nation and our region in March of 2020, others pivoted to provide critical supplies such as food, PPE, and other resources to just simply survive. In a few minutes, we'll hear from two of the inaugural grantees who will share their experiences and a couple of stories about the impact these grants had on them in 2019 and 2020. Now here we are nearly 18 months, it's hard to believe, but 18 months after the world as we knew it really ended and came to a halt with an even greater concern for the well-being of, and the future of women and children in our area and around the country. According to the US Labor or the US Bureau of Labor Statistics, nearly 1.9 fewer women are in the labor force in 2020 compared to just one year prior with the unemployment rate among women at nearly 8.3%. Now, 
Now, I know I don't have to tell all of you about the many challenges of hiring and retaining employees these days, particularly in the nonprofit sector, healthcare, hospitality, and education, which were all roles traditionally filled by women. This is further exacerbated by the closing of schools, changing in schedules, and the lack of affordable quality daycare, paired, of course, with the heightened cost of basic supplies like gas and groceries. The challenges are overwhelming and too, list to long, too long to list and really have impacted all women and their families, particularly women of color and in low-income communities. For these reasons and more, we remain committed to doing our part and getting out the help and hope that this funding opportunity will continue to elevate this population and move them towards healthy, productive lives. So I'll now turn over the microphone and the camera to Rich for some additional remarks, and then we'll hear from Marianne in a couple of minutes. Thank you, everyone. Hey, good morning, all. Um, there's so many things that I want to say today, but for time purposes, um, I want to thank you for taking the time out today to join us in particular. Before I start, I just want to thank, there's so many people that we could thank for their, for their efforts and, and bravery and courage the last 18 months, but I just wanted to recognize a couple of folks. Number one, um, uh, the Community Foundation of Orange and Sullivan under business leadership and all the great people who support her here. Thank you for everything you do. I want to thank the Dyson Foundation for their um, amazing um, leadership during the last 18 months, especially for their, you know, the communications and their surveys and identifying what your challenges were in particular during the last 18 months. I think that was very helpful to, to, to all of us. Uh, and I want to thank, uh, I, I think you all know, and there's a lot of folks here from Ulster County today, which we're very excited about. Um, they're, they're part of, of this, um, this funding process. And in particular, uh, Stacy Stacy Ryan from the United Way, who was tremendously helpful to us, particularly during the last 12 to 14 months, uh, while the foundation remained very active in all counties. Ariane's gonna kind of go over some of the things that we feel like we accomplished. Um, but Stacy was very helpful to Marianne uh, um, in, in the, her Ulster um, endeavors. Uh, carve and otherwise. And uh, so I wanted to thank those folks. Um, so, you know, this really all started, it's hard to believe, but in 2018, I think most of you have are familiar with this report that we um, put together with the Moonshine Group's help. Um, and uh, then we kicked the fund off in March of two, 2019. But I think when you look at the report, um, I guess the happy, sad, you know, part of it is, is that, you know, I'm happy that we did so much great work in the last three years, but sad that many of these issues that were identified in the report remain probably at the same level that they were when this report was put together, in many cases, probably worse. So on top of that, we have many issues that have, have raised their ugly head during the pandemic as a result, mainly of children in schools um, and all the challenges that these these young folks face out there now. So we have to kind of add that to our to our report here. But I think I think the fund is going to remain you know we remain targeted on those issues. So these these are the areas that we want to kind of focus on. And uh, um, just like the last round, you know we're, we're looking for your grants to kind of be in those areas. Um, so. Obviously, we're open. We're open, open-minded, but I just wanted to kind of, um, you know, uh, reinforce that. Um, the other thing is, is that we still feel very strongly um, years later that the nonprofit community, which is you, are still the best way for us to get to get get out there and take care, target these issues, and get at them versus any other method. Um, you know, you guys are in touch with the community. I mean, you've all been through. Uh, just, an, I'm sure, amazing. You probably have all many stories that you could tell about the last 18 months, but we still we still feel very strongly that you're you are the best conduit um, for us to get these funds out and get them to work um, in 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 the best way possible. So, um, I think you know that's why you're here today. That's why we're talking. No one understands the roots of the community better than you do, um, and so, make you know we remain committed to that. 
Um, so, you know, this this is this is our second full you know full round. Uh, we did a full round in 2019, um, and uh, sure, obviously we took we took a breather for many many reasons, as you know. Um, back here today, and uh, we're looking forward to kicking this off today. So, on that note. Um, I don't think that I missed anything I wanted to say, um, but I'm going to turn the microphone over, so to speak, the Zoom call over to Marianne. <laughs> the owl. Uh, the who's owl. gonna tell us a little bit about what the foundation was up to last year. Thank you. This year. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna pick up at the, um, at the start of the pandemic way back in March, 2020. And I know they always say it's it's not good to go backwards. It's really best to go forward. But for the purposes of this conversation, we thought that we might take a moment to shed some light um, on how we decided to move forward in support of COVID-related critical needs over the past year and a half. And certainly when the world hit the pause button, we also held off in dis um, distributing grants from the Fund for Women and Children we felt as we have come to say that this was going to be a pandemic of many seasons. And in fact, it has been unfortunately much longer than we all anticipated, much deeper impacts and ripple effect than, than we all anticipated. But we began to talk to people and have Zoom calls, many of you who are on this call with us today, in addition to school superintendents. And what really was touching us deeply was the, was the impact this pandemic was having on our children, and in particular, the disruption to their education and home lives. We became, through, through many different stories that you've all shared with us, aware of working parents, in particular single mothers, who were running out of options for childcare, didn't have proper technology for their children uh, to do their work and to learn, a healthy environment for learning, healthy meals, social, social interaction and connection. So we decided, particularly when it was um, evident that schools were not gonna be able to go back in person learning, that it was time to step in and step up and support those agencies who pivoted so quickly to provide these critical services. Among them are the Center for Creative Education, the Boys and Girls Club of Ulster County, the Middletown YMCA, the Kingston YMCA, the Hodge Center, and a teen parent program led by Frank Mulhern for high school kids at Ele the Ellenville School District. Each of these agencies worked collaboratively together. They pivoted on a dime um, to meet a need as a remote learning center, providing self, safe and healthy spaces for parents to leave their children while they then had to return to work. And in many cases, they did so free of charge. They provided both breakfast and lunch. Um, in many cases, they established food pantries so that these parents could also pick up dinner for their, when they were picking up their children provided the necessary technology, they provided tutoring and mentoring, the list just goes on and on. It's, it's um, in, in incredible what they did so very quickly. And while this seemed like a radically different strategy, giving strategy than our original mission expressed for the Fund for Women and Children regarding transformative change, we really felt that this, hub, this, this public health crisis required a radically different outlook. And we really felt over the past year and a half that this was one of the best ways that we could utilize um, our resources. Additionally, we, we helped to launch the COVID fund through the Community Foundation of Orange and Sullivan Counties. We gave similarly to the fund for the Community Foundation of the Hudson Valley. We also gave to a wonderful organization called the Single Bite in, in Sullivan County that pivoted from a nutrition school-based program to providing thousands of unbelievably nutritious meals for many, many families living in very rural, remote, remote parts of, of Sullivan County. So we feel the timeliness of this grant cycle is critical to all of you in our nonprofit world to inspire, to continue to inspire not only transformative change, also really to restore wholeness and wellness to our local communities. So we'll continue to monitor this health crisis and we count on you to bring to light um, ongoing critical needs, and we, we hope to bridge those gaps whenever we're able. Um, we're committed, as, as both Biz and Rich have said, we're more committed than ever to supporting you through this unprecedented time, even though we're sort of tired of saying that. And we really look here, we really are looking forward to reading your, your uh, proposals, your applications, 
and staying in touch with you over the next four to six weeks as this process unfolds. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, both of you, for, for your remarks and incredible leadership. Um, I know you say thank you to the Community Foundation, but really thank you to you both for, oh, I'm going to get oh, choked geez. up. I can't help myself. This is me, always crying and getting getting choked up. But anyhow, it was, it was it's, me last time, so it's, I, it's your turn. It's my turn, I guess, today. So um, anyhow, thank you for your, your incredible leadership. And Lauren, I know you're not going to say a word over there, but thank you for all that you do um, for the Fund for Women and Children and really outside of this initiative for our community. I know you've been very busy through the pandemic, shopping for homebound folks and doing all sorts of good work. So thank you for that. Um, so as I mentioned, we wanted to uh, hear from a couple of our inaugural grantees um, this morning. We thought it might be um, interesting for you all to hear from them and, and learn a little bit about their programs as well as you know how these grants really supported their work. So we are going to start with hearing from Lorraine Salmon, who is the Executive Director of Institutional Advancement for Ulster Community College Foundation, um, to share a little bit about what, uh, what they call their Lights for Learning program. So Lorraine, you're up. Elizabeth, thank you very much, and don't get the crying started because we do that daily around here. Um, so we start by just thanking you. We, we received an initial $30,000 grant for Lights for Learning. Lights for Learning was founded some 20 years ago here at SUNY Ulster. We were really way ahead of our time. Um, we realized that um, there were so many things that happened to a student during the course of their education, and so often we think of students going to college as coming out of high school and going to college. But as many of you know, community college, it is so often um, adults, um, folks who, for whatever reason, um, had to leave their education and are circling back their parents, they have children, sometimes their parents with children going to college and um, parents who are aging and they're trying to go back to college. So it gets very complicated. I see my friend Dawn on, on the call too, and she can vouch for that at SUNY Orange. So, um, we, we assisted with your $30,000 of funding. Um, and then there was another $5,000 that got matched by uh, SUNY for our Lights for Learning program. So um, that brought us um, up to a total of 40. Over 50 students and their families were assisted. Uh, there were 57 grants awarded. Uh, the support of these students funded by the rally grants went to things such as childcare, mental health counseling, electric bills, rent payments, past due tuition, allowing a former student who maybe didn't finish their education was never able to pay their past bill. And they come back five, 10, 15 years later, and they have everything in line to restart their education, but they have no means to pay that past bill. And it stops most students from restarting. So you were able to help us often with that. Um, car loan payments, textbooks for over 20 students, those awards ranged from $76 to $825. And the other thing we'd like to share with you is when a student doesn't have $76, they don't have $76. They, they, they can't get the book for the class. And we hear through the grapevine that they're borrowing the book from, so can you imagine trying to juggle your life and borrow a book? So enough said. Um, car repairs, fingerprinting fees for student teaching. So they got their degree, they're out there and they're student teaching and they don't have the money to get certified so that they can student teach. Um, home oil delivery and other things such as that. On a global perspective, uh, the funds that we received help us deal with, with our students for homelessness, um, escaping domestic violence, um, health issues regarding being homeless and being pregnant at the same time and still coming here to school, um, overcoming disabilities. And of course we go to other funding sources first and we counsel and we help the students access everything that they can, but maybe you wouldn't be surprised to find out, you know, we still um, have students in really desperate need for assistance with their disabilities. Um, and car accidents, you know, a car, a simple car accident can completely derail. I don't even mean the student, the whole family, just derail the family. They can't move the kids around. They can't handle all the things that you're all just talking about, especially during COVID. <clears throat> the process that we put in place, uh, we became very nimble. We used to make decisions like this, you know, quarterly. And here at SUNY Ulster, we make these decisions daily. So we literally have a Lights for Learning portal. 
somebody comes in and we if like, so I'm here with my director of scholarships, Sheila Dvorak. If a student walked in right now, one of us would leave what we're doing and go interview them. That goes immediately to a committee and within three or four hours, everybody gets in the portal and votes and the check gets cut. Uh, we keep cash on hand in case the situation is that dire and the student needs to sign out the cash and then we collect it from the fund. Um, and so I think the biggest, I know there's a lot to be said today, so I'll end quickly, but the biggest overarching thing that I would wanna share um, with the rallies in particular, um, and all of you who are receiving their funds is that for me, this changed our belief. Um, we used to think we were just you know, scholarships and that kind of assistance. And while we were working this fund, uh, we never quite exercised it to the depths that we did when we had the donation from the Rally Family Fund for 30,000 on top of the 20,000 we would have awarded that year. And all of a sudden we were looking at 50 and then we were able to go um, with a state grant. We raised another 65,000 of that 50 got matched. So in one year, last year during COVID, we awarded $120,000 in emergency grants. And I'm telling you, we did that from last June to last um, December, most of it. And it was like full-time work. I mean, there was just constantly people here. So I know you don't have time for all the stories. I can tell you that most intakes require us getting the student out of your office as quickly as possible so that you can grab a box of tissues and call somebody in another office because you just don't even know how they're holding themselves up. And then when you tell them you're gonna help them and that you're gonna cut a check for a thousand or $1,500, they just disintegrate. You know, they're like, what? So that's what I have to say. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Lorraine. And thank you for everything that you and your team are doing really, really powerful work. Um, so next up, um, we're gonna hear from our colleagues from Montefiore St. Luke's Cornwall Hospital, uh, Joan Cusack McGurk, their president and CEO, and Margaret Allers, their vice president of patient care services. Uh, to give, again, a little overview of the program that we funded uh, in 2019. So Joan and Margaret. First of all, Ben, thank you. Thank you to you and um, the foundation. Um, it was really, I have to say, and uh, categorize it. First of all, uh, second of all, Lorraine, you're a hard act to follow. You had me crying here. So <laughs> kudos, girlfriend. Really, really a, a incredible work. So we were fortunate enough to receive a $50,000 grant. And we live in, um, our hospital is located, we have two campuses, one in Newburgh and one in Cornwall. In our Newburgh campus, we have um, maternity, OB, um, obstetrics, and NICU. And we had seen a lot of moms come through the doors with opioid addictions, uh, very specifically heroin. And our what we were trying to do is get a resource, which we did. We hired a resource through um, the assistance of this grant, and this resource stays in, in place today. And what she does is she connects with the um, addicted mom, because the mom is very fearful that the baby is going to be taken away from her. So we set up a structure who my colleague, Margaret is a, a, our chief nurse here and our vice president of patient care services, and she sees, um, oversees all clinical practice, and in this instance, very specifically OB. So I want to turn it over to her, but I will tell you, Biz, this was life-changing, not just for the moms and the babies, but also for our staff, and it remains the stays in place today. So I turn it over to my colleague, Margaret. Thank you, and, and, and thank you uh, to the Rowley family and to um, uh, the Women and, um, and Children Fund um, I have to say this, this one was very near and, and dear to, um, to my heart. Uh, I've been a nurse for 37 years and I've watched um, addicted moms come into our hospital, deliver their babies um, and their babies um, being taken away, rightfully so. They are addicted and they can't support their, uh, their babies and they're reckless. And, um, and, and they cry and they, and they wanna keep their babies but they can't control their addiction. So. Two years ago, we had this vision to help support those mothers who are addicted to drugs and who find themselves pregnant without any means or solution uh, for their baby and for themselves. Um, again, many are frightened that if they let anyone know that they are pregnant and that, they're, uh, that, and that they are still doing drugs, that the babies will be taken away from them, which uh, quite honest, honestly, uh, that, that is a true statement. 
Um, the many are frightened to get prenatal care. Um, again, fear for the system, fear of the system. Uh, they know if they, they are found out to be addicts, that they will be followed, and uh, and they worry that they are again that they'll deliver and their baby will be taken away from them. Um, we hear uh, far too often that the mothers they tell us that they you know they try to stop doing drugs and often they'll commit themselves to not doing it again for the sake of the baby. However, as we know um, far too well that addiction is powerful, and despite their attempts. Once the withdrawal sets in, that they end up uh, relapsing. So our vision was to insert ourselves and partner with the addict as their coach, uh, show them the way to a safe way to finish their pregnancy. Or ideally, we want to catch them, um, you know, in the middle of their uh, their pregnancy. Um, and at this point, the, the solution is generally uh, when we partner with them is to get them on suboxone or, or methadone. I'm not saying I'm a proponent of switching one to to another, but suboxone and methadone make people live. Uh, many years, some forever on, on methadone, and it helps them to get into that reckless um, life that, that, they're, that they're living out on the streets and, uh, and you know, um, doing whatever they need to do in order to get the next, uh, the next drug. Uh, we had, uh, that gives us the time to assist them in getting housing, a safe environment for the baby, and again, stop that reckless behavior and get them to become a functional good parent. Um, we do meet many parents for the first time once they arrive at the hospital, but again, our ultimate goal is to engage with them at the time that they are still pregnant. And we've, and, um, we've worked a lot with our um, recovery um, in a lot of our um, community services to help us to, uh, to, to, get the, to get the message out and to be able to speak to women who are, uh, who are addicted and, and you know, trying to get into recovery. So our first year was about partnering with many, program, many of the programs that assist drug ad addicted women and to convince the women that we were here to help. Their goal was not to take their baby away, but to, to help them and that, so that they can keep their baby by successfully getting them into an outpatient program and to get their life together again with housing and a means to support them and their baby. Trust was one of the biggest hurdles that we had to overcome because they needed to be able to trust us and did not think that we were just, you know, uh, trying to manipulate them. Another, another goal that we had was to help the mother to know what to expect, to not, to not think that we were going to judge them but what, once they deliver and to trust that we don't want to take the baby, which is why we want to partner with them during their pregnancy. The, uh, the baby will absolutely be in our NICU and we want, them to, we want to help them to sort of forgive themselves and understand that the baby's journey for the next four to six weeks was going to be that they were going to go through withdrawal. They, even on methadone, they'll go through withdrawal, but it was an opportunity and a time for us to keep the mother going through recovery and, and, and helping to create that foundation. Um, so the mother is, is meets with the na navigator and we assure and, and start to create that foundation of stability uh, in, in place for the mom. Uh, our program, we called it um, Making Successful Life Choices. Uh, we thought that the, our, our uh, birthing staff team um, actually uh, created that name. Um, uh, they thought it was very appropriate. It's also the initials of Montefiore St. Luke's Foremost. They thought that that was pretty neat. So again, it began the two years ago. We hired Symphony Bar Barton. She's our patient navigator, a social worker by background. She was very important to this program. And again, initially, uh, what we set out to do was to, um, was to create the foundation. And we committed ourselves to see 12 patients in the, in the first year. And we thought that that was might be a little uh, steep because, um, you know, again, the, we were trying to get ourselves out there, our hospitals, the staff who have taken babies away from mothers who are addicted, rightfully so again, um, you know, to try and create a trust out in the community. And uh, in the past two years, we've seen 84 patients. So we more than exceeded our goal. The goal for Cynthia is to, was to help those new mothers be successful in their recovery. Um, some of the women, again, come to us pregnant, using substances, asking for help. Many women come uh, uh, and come through inpatient, other inpatient programs that they are struggling with. Um, some women have lost their babies due to substance use and, and we engage them at, at that point. But our ultimate goal, again, is to engage them during their, uh, their pregnancy. And we've been able to, you know, uh, you know catch many pe people through partnering again with the community services. We've been able to capture many uh, uh, mothers who have been, um, you know, uh, you know, during their pregnancy. Uh, we have helped them and, and walked them through the most incredible complex um, and frustrating processes of going through, you know, DSS, obtaining housing, staying in the program. Many of them have to attend court uh, proceedings and helping them through that is very discouraging for them. And often is, is part of the reasons why they'll say that they relapse. So us being a coach to, to, um, to these women have really helped them to be success successful. We've created through, through the last couple of years, um, again, work with the re uh, referrals and, and local agency and really having them support us. We've been able to create a lot of uh, support groups for these patients. So we've created a, um, 
um, a support group uh, via Zoom, and it's very, very well received. Many of the mothers that we've helped from, from two years ago are still meeting with us. Um, just some statistics on the programs. We have eight mothers ha that have been granted custody of their babies that have previously, the babies had been in foster care. Four more are currently working on, on, on getting custody. Um, it, it's a, it's, it's sometimes it's, it's months of, of working alongside them, but we're committing to help them. We had 11 mothers who were assisted with housing applications. Two moved into supportive housing and one is living in a Section 8 housing. 12 mothers were assisted with uh, intake processes for inpatient treatment. Eight, eight of those 12 followed through and were admitted and to date are still attending meetings and actively participating in their recovery and have their babies and have not relapsed uh, but continue to attend uh, Cynthia's uh, weekly support groups. And we have six mothers who is, who are just, just recently started on in an intensive outpatient treatment and five that continue with uh, treatment uh, today. So many, uh, again, a high, this is a high risk population to relapse and many who with the support of uh, our, our navigator have been able to, um, to, to, to be successful. I can't tell you the great feelings to see so many women who are about to lose their babies for good and to, and to have the, see them ha be able to put forth through this program to support them and, and get them uh, ready to, to become sober and start putting a, a good, solid, stable foundation in place and to be able to keep their, um, their babies. We have one mother that, that started, um, we met uh, probably two years ago and she had lost her first child and she was about to lose her second child. She was um, maybe seven months, eight months pregnant when, when we met her. And, um, and, uh, and she was very heavily addicted uh, to heroin. We were able to help her to get her onto uh, methadone. Her, again, her baby was in our NICU, um, you know, uh, was, was here with us. Um, and at, by, at the time the baby was uh, discharged at the hospital, she had been on a, sol on, on a program. We were able to get her housing and she was able to keep um, her second baby. And this past year in April, she actually was, uh, was able to get her, her first child back again. She has a stable um, home. She is, um, she is currently working and remains in program. And, and again, is one of the uh, uh, members that, that uh, has been a big advocate for the program and has, uh, has attended all of the, um, the support groups and, and helped others in the support group to be successful. So this has been an incredible program for us and one that has, uh, again, you know, we had a vision and we were able to make that vision come uh, true, come through, you know, um, with the funding that was provided by the Rowley family. So again, we thank you. Great job. Wow. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Talk about the tissue box, holy moly. <laughs> thank you for, for sharing all of that information and, and the stories and, um, you know, on top of what I can imagine was an incredibly challenging time with with COVID-19 and, you know, a high patient load and, and all the other challenges. So thank you to, to everyone at the hospital for, for your efforts. Um, thank and you. thank you, Lorraine. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, and again, Lorraine, thank you so much for sharing a little bit about, um, you know, your experiences at, at the college as well. Um, so now you're probably all wondering what's next. Um, so we're excited to say that as of this morning, um, applications to apply for funding for 2020, 20, 2022 are officially open. You can find those applications on the Community Foundation's website. We'll drop that link in the chat in a moment. Um, but again, we encourage you to think about innovative and unique programs that you're providing to really support and elevate women, children, and families in Orange, Sullivan, and Ulster counties. Last time around, we did have several, several collaborative applications, as well as applications that impacted, you know, groups from across the three county area. So we really do encourage you again to think about those collaborations, ways to work together, and, you know, truly make a difference. Um, once again, we are looking at a relatively short timeline, but I know um, I know how the nonprofit sector works, and I know a, a good deadline is is encouragement. So we are looking for these applications to be submitted on or before Friday, November nineteenth. Um, so just a week before Thanksgiving, and about a month from today. Um, we also encourage you. Again, if you have not already to look back at that 2018 women and children report that we mentioned earlier in the call that can also be found on the Community Foundation's website. Um, take a look through it because those really continue to be our primary focus areas for grants um, moving into 2022. 
Grants, again, this round will be available for $15,000 to $50,000. Um, we're not saying exactly how many we're going to consider. It really just depends. Uh, last round, we received about 90 applications, uh, totaling several million dollars. It was a a very difficult process uh, to make those decisions. And um, again, so many wonderful organizations doing great work out there. Um, but again, that range really is $15,000 to $50,000 uh, for those, those grants ultimately. So our intention is that those applications will be reviewed after November 19th. Funding decisions will be finalized and made by mid-December. Um, before the year concludes, of course, so that proper planning can be done for 2022. Um, we hope that you all will agree as you're moving through the process that the application is not too cumbersome, certainly not uh, anything compared to the, the state and federal grants that I'm sure many of you have battled with uh, over the years, but really we tried to get right to the heart of the issue, um, requesting responses to some straightforward and important questions um, on that application. Um, as always, uh, the team here at the Community Foundation of Orange and Sullivan is available to answer any of your questions, so please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, again, I'll just uh, mention my crew, and I, I failed to mention Stacy Muller. She's working from home today, so not, not top of mind, but certainly a really important member of our team. Our Director of, of Finance and Operations is always available, along with Lisa Mitchell, Nicole Feller-Lee, and Megan Martini. So please, please do reach out with, with any questions. Um, it is all running through the Community Foundation's grant portal, so you'll be asked to create a username and password. You can go back and work on your application in draft form before that final submission, which I know is also uh, often very helpful when you're working through these applications. Um, so please um, take a look at that. And again, that deadline is Friday, November 19th. So that really wraps up our remarks. I'm going to just check the, the chat um, here to see if we have any questions, um, but we certainly do welcome any, any questions there. And we'll address those for, for the next couple of minutes and then um, let you all move on with your day. So um, it looks like, again, the, the link is there, uh, cfosny.org, um, right front and center on the, the website, there is um, a box to bring you to the, the page for the Fund for Women and Children that has both that report, a link to the application portal, um, and some other information and, and background on the fund. Um, looks like we have a question from Prasad just about the name of the program at, at St. Luke's Cornwall. So, um, that was making successful life choices is what they've coined it. Uh, very clever to go along with MSLC, just like Montefiore St. Luke's Cornwall. Um, and I think that's the only, uh, let's see what else. Oh, my friend Aaron Caffarelli from the Children's Home of Poughkeepsie. Can an organization be based in Duchess but serve women and children in the three counties you are funding? Yes, absolutely. Um, again, I think we are really looking to focus um, the funding in, you know, really to directly impact women in, in those three counties we've mentioned. But certainly, if your headquarters is elsewhere, but the programs um, are, you know, supporting those those three counties, absolutely, you you are certainly welcome to apply. Um, one other question here from the YIT Foundation. Um, in regards to using funding towards formula and housing for the families that has premature babies. Certainly, I think that's something we would consider. Again, it's really, um, you know, geared towards uh, women and children. Um, as long as it's in those three counties that we're serving, um, we're open to, to reviewing the application. So yes, Sharon, I would say, please, uh, please do move forward with that. Uh, Jenny Swans, would you consider support of programs that serve individuals on both a local as well as larger regional basis as in New York State? Um, I think we would, would consider it. Again, really our focus is here locally, so I think you know, that might take priority. Um, again, Ulster, Sullivan, and, and Orange County, but um, I think you know, if it's tied to a statewide organization or really has a larger footprint, I think I think that that would be something we would be interested in in taking a look at. All right, any any last questions, anybody? Oh, we got 
who do we call to resex access? That's always a popular question. <laughs> uh, so certainly you can you can call the foundation office. Uh, our number here is 845-769-9393. Um, I think Meg and Lisa are really our, our tech gurus when it comes to the grant interface. So give, give them a ring um, and they can certainly help you reset uh, your username and password. It's always the little things, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's see, Stephanie. Would you consider support for special juvenile immigration status helping abandoned immigrant children under 21 to receive green cards and legal residence status? Well, it's a pretty specific question, but I, <laughs> I think we would consider it. Again, I think we're open to um, you know, innovative programs that are, are yeah, if, if there's a compelling you know, reason and, and story behind, you know, this particular group, I think we'd have to see the overall scope of work yeah. and results of it. Yeah. Yep. What the strategy is. <clears throat> How can we access the recording of this session? Good question, Maxine. So once we're wrapped up, we will uh, post a link to this on our website. Um, I'm thinking it'll likely live on our YouTube page, but uh, we'll put a link out there um, so you can share it. And again, for anyone who might be on the call today who's involved with other organizations or knows of other groups that um, you know should know about this initiative, please do feel free to, to share away. Michelle, at recap, can two agencies apply separately for a collaborative program? That's a good question. Um, I think so. I mean, I would say yes, if you're each, you know, sort of handling a specific piece of the, the program, piece of the pie, I think, um, again, we would, we would certainly be open to that. All good questions, everyone. Thanks for, <laughs> thanks for sending them all in. All right, well, we'll wait another, another couple seconds to see if there's any last questions in. Oh, here we go. Um, does the funding have to go to women and children? No, not necessarily. That's that's a good question, though. I think it can can certainly be one or the other. Um, you know, I'll say in round one, I think many of them were focused on on both groups, but um, but certainly open again. I guess to some of the um, the background at, at SUNY Ulster, they may not have been you know, mothers, but, but women too. So yeah, I think we're definitely, yeah. yeah. Yep. Yeah. We're open to that. Good question. Okay. Last or one more question here. I apologize if it was said, but is general operating support for a program or are you looking for new or innovative programs? I think they don't necessarily need to be new, but I think we are uh, honed in on, you know, the innovation piece, um, you know, in terms of general operating support, I think that can often mean, you know, supporting a staff member or other, you know, general expenses of an organization. And I think as long as it, you know, ties back and has really a direct impact on, on the programs, then, you know, I certainly think it's something we consider. Are faith-based organizations included? So yes, they are, but I think we'd like to see um, them being open to people of, of all backgrounds, like many of the faith-based organizations locally, Jewish Family Services. I know Paul Israel is on the call, um, really serving people from all backgrounds and denominations. So I would say as long as it's, it's open, we're certainly, um, certainly game to see those proposals. All good questions. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, all right, well, it's 1045, so we like to uh, under promise and oh, one more here, all right. Lori, hi, Lori, how you doing? Um, do you limit administrative support to 15% if hiring an additional staff member is essential for the operation of the program? No. No, I don't think we have any limitations like that. Um, I think we're, you know, we're open, no specific formulas or, um, you know, restrictions in, in that area. Good question, because I know you do see that with a lot of grants, though, those kind of limitations. 
Thank you, Lorraine. That's your, <laughs> thank you for your comment. <laughs> All right, well, thank you all again for, for tuning in this morning. Again, please don't hesitate to reach out to the foundation if you have any questions. Um, I'll just rattle off our phone number one more time, 769-9393. And our website is cfosny.org. Again, right there on the homepage, you can find information about the Fund for Women and Children um, and link right to that grant portal to get started with your application. So. Thank you all so much for, for tuning in this morning. And again, thank you for all the work that you're doing and have done through, through COVID. Um, I know it's certainly been a, a very difficult time and one I hope that we um, will not soon be back to, but um, wishing everyone good health and, uh, and safety as we continue to go and, and enter the winter months. And we'll look forward to hearing from all of you in the, in the weeks and months ahead. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.